Good morning, church family. Welcome to Council Road today. Um, we are, we're going to sing a song over you this morning. And uh, it's a song that's unique to our church that just released today um, called Even Death Obeys. And I want to invite you at any point, if you feel that you want to stand in an expression of worship, you're invited to. Um, but stay seated while we sing this over you.
were folded clothes Cause by your breath Jesus you arose You still speak in gentle whispers So may we listen close And use us as we see your King may be seated. Even Death Obeys. What a wonderful song preparing us for next Sunday. And I want to thank all the volunteers that were here this morning rehearsing. Many of them beat me here this morning. We are so blessed to have so many volunteers in our worship ministry. Also, I want you to know that Eric Wall, our worship minister, wrote that song, Even Death Obeys. And... It was produced right here at Council Road. We're so blessed to have this type of music coming out of Council Road. Now, in light of Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, next week, 1030, here in the room, we'll have one service. I want to encourage you to extend an invite to someone the Lord may have put on your heart. Don't overthink it. As you invite them, if they say no, that's okay. If you invite them and they say yes, that's okay. Great, but it's that simple. Just extend that invite. Also, I want you to know in April, we're going to be teaching through our 24 essentials, and you can pick up book number two in the foyer this Sunday or next Sunday or in your connection class. We're going to start with our eight essential doctrines of the faith. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here today. There's a card in front of you. It's called a response card. We'd love to get some information, see how we can get to know you help get you plugged in. There's also a place on that card where anyone in this room can write down a prayer request that you might have. We would love to pray for you. We pray every Monday as a staff. So give us that honor by hearing your prayer need and let us pray over you. As we continue in worship for our call to worship, I want to read Mark chapter 10 verse 45 over us. Jesus, as he's preparing to die, notice what he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man, Jesus said, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus' death and resurrection. Help us believe that this is true for us today and help us follow Jesus. Thank you that even death obeys you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Abe. As we sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, it is a joy as a congregation that we get to do songs of faith, even original songs of faith. I don't know if you know that that's a little unique, but it is, and what a blessing that is to our church. The next song we're going to sing is a stalwart hymn of the faith appropriate for this season. Would you stand as we sing, When I Survey the Wonders Cross? Oh. 
Let's continue our worship this morning. Amazing pity, great. 
redemption today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. And all God's people said, great singing. This morning you may be seated. Listen to the choir as we sing the wonder of the cross in the whole Texas. May we never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. Father in heaven, this morning, as I've thought about this Holy Week for several weeks now, I pray and I've prayed and I've thought and I've read your word and I pray that today many have been believers for a long time, but may we never lose the wonder, 
the wonder of what Jesus did for us on that cross. May it be afresh. May it, like the songs said, may we see it for the like the first time as a sinner that needed to be saved by our Savior. We love you, Lord Jesus. Please take our worship for what it is from broken people and broken lives. And we lay it at the foot of the cross and just love you deeply with all that we are this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's congregation said, amen. 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 Norman, thank you. Worship team, thank you so much for pointing us to the cross of Christ as we near Easter. Um, and as we continue in our worship during this offertory prayer, I want to encourage you, the, the ways to give are on the screen behind me. We just want to say thank you for your faithfulness here at Council Road. Your faithfulness in giving, we can't do it without you. We want to also say thank you for your faithfulness in serving and giving of your time um, and your love for each other and for the Lord. We, uh, we, we so appreciate all that you do as church members here at Council Road. Today, our text uh, in, in our preaching will be the triumphal entry, uh, appropriate for this Palm Sunday. And the people, when they see Jesus, will say, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means Save us, Lord. And similarly, our cry should be the same. Psalm 118, 25 through 26 says, Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Let's pray together as we receive our offering this morning. Lord, we thank you. For this reminder that you, in fact, saved us. That we are not left alone in our sin, but because of Christ, we can see the joy of life with you. Help us while we're here together today as a church. Be thankful for the words in which we know are true and trustworthy from your scriptures. Would you speak through Rick today as he brings this passage to us? Would you, Holy Spirit, speak through him? And Lord, would you help our hearts this week, cry out, save us, Lord. We desperately need you. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church family. How wonderful to be with you this morning on this Palm Sunday, a day in which we commemorate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And to guide us in... Uh, our teaching this morning, I want us to look together at John chapter 12, and we will be reading verses 12 through 19, which of course is the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And uh, this is a, a wonderful way for us to prepare for Easter next Sunday, to think about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And, and so would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word, John chapter 12, Verses 12 through 19, if you're new here, this is something that we uh, like to do each week um, in honor of God's word as we read the text of the day. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd had come for the festival heard, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this, this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God for it. Palm Sunday 
is about the king coming. It's about the king coming and bringing blessing. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, and, and that's what I want to reflect on this morning. The coming of the king and our need for blessedness. That word blessedness, incidentally, in the original text, the original Hebraic meaning of the word blessedness that is translated here uh, it means to be thriving in every way. It means human flourishing in all aspects of life. It is peace and joy and all of the things that would make us fulfilled as human beings. It, it's, what, it's what all of us seek. It's what every human heart longs for. We all long for human flourishing in every aspect of life, and, and that's what this word means. The expectation here is that the king is coming, and he's going to bring us everything that we would need, all that life could offer. Now, now isn't it true that the world really can't offer us the things that we most long for? Uh, we go through life longing for uh, those things that we think are going to make us happy. We think that money might make us happy, and then uh, we realize that money can't make us happy. You know, the, if money could make you happy, the wealthiest people in the world would be the happiest people in the world. And, and we all know that that's not true. Uh, maybe you're thinking, oh, well, I would at least like to try. Um, but money, ca money can't make us happy. If, if we think that success in our business is going to make us happy, then we're going to be disappointed in that because uh, very often you get all the things that you want uh, in your career only to wonder if this is all that it, that it was meant to be. Um, if you think that your relationships are going to make you happy, relationships often disappoint us. Relationships will not ultimately make you happy. Your family will disappoint you. Your loved ones will disappoint you. Your uh, your, your friends will disappoint you. You have a circle of friends for a while and then it seems that they dissipate. Um, you have uh, um, good uh, uh, things in life and then those things tend to uh, fade away. Um, every flower ends up in a compost pile at some point. The, the, the things in this life just really don't last that long. If you're, if you're depending on your looks, you know, your looks aren't going to last forever. Um, everything in this life, in other words, is fading away. And so this world cannot bring you blessedness. It can't bring you what this word means, which is to mean flourishing in every way, to have satisfaction and joy and happiness and peace in all of life. And yet we learn throughout life that those things that we think are going to make us happy really are not, are not going to make us happy at all. They're really not going to fulfill us at all because all of these things are fleeting. Um, as I've said many times, you know, a lot of people get into the if only trap of life. If only I could graduate, then I would be happy. If only I could find a spouse, then I would be happy. If only I could get married, then I would be happy. If only we could have kids, then we would be happy. If only... Uh, my kids would leave home, then we would be happy. You know, it, it, we're all going through, to some degree, a kind of if only cycle of life. If only this, if only that. But we learn that all of these things in life are just fleeting. They are, they are temporary. And, and, and so where do we find this blessedness? And the message that I want to get across, I want all of us to reflect on this morning is that you are not going to find this kind of blessedness until you meet the king, okay? You are not going to get these things in life. You're not going to experience this kind of blessedness, this kind of ultimate joy and peace for all of life until you meet the king. And so we want to talk this morning about what this means, um, Luke describes Palm Sunday like this in Luke 19, 37 and 38. As he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to speak and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had been saying. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory 
in the highest. There was no doubt that in the disciples' mind as they were watching Jesus come into Jerusalem, they were thinking of Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from, the, from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And this is what stands out in the Palm Sunday event. I want us to see the characteristics of the king as he comes. I want you to notice that he comes in great power and authority on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's coming very humbly. And what I want to propose to all of us is that we all instinctively, every human being, every human heart longs for this kind of king. We are all looking for the king. One who is mighty, has power and authority, and who is humble. Those are the the qualities that we see in Jesus as he comes on Palm Sunday, Sunday, and these are the things that we are all looking for. We are all looking for the one who can show us the way, the one who is the authority, the one who brings life, who brings blessedness, and the one who comes to us humbly. And that's what we see in Jesus. So I want to make a few points about this. Number one, I want us to see that the true king is both mighty and meek. That Jesus is both strong and humble. Jesus knew what he was doing. He comes into Jerusalem. He gets on the donkey and he, and he rides into Jerusalem. And you might be asking yourself as you read this story or you think about it, what kind of king comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. I mean, the picture itself seems a little ridiculous, doesn't it? The conquering king, the mighty king of the universe, riding into Jerusalem, Jerusalem triumphantly on a donkey. Okay, I mean, you can't imagine that picture in any other historical event, can you? I mean, you, can't, you, uh, you cannot imagine Caesar Augustus riding through the streets of Rome on a donkey. You can't imagine Alexander the Great riding through Macedonia on a donkey. It just doesn't make any sense. A conquering king leading a conquering army normally comes on a, on a, on a large white stallion with great pomp and circumstance promoting his kingliness, promoting his conquering power. But that's not how Jesus came. Jesus came on a tiny donkey. Why? Because he was showing the world that he was both mighty and meek. It is indicative of his character. Jesus came to this world not as a conquering hero, but he's born in a borrowed manger in Bethlehem, a backwater village of a backwater country in the Roman Empire. He was born to a single mom uh, under scandalous circumstances. And why did he do that? Why did he come this way? Why would Jesus, the creator of the universe, come in such a humble way? The answer to that is because he wanted all of us to be able to identify with him. He is both king and he is humble. Uh, I want you to notice Revelation chapter 5 paints a picture of the kind of king that all of us are looking for. This is what it says. But no one in heaven uh, or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And now look at verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Do you see that picture? The lion and the lamb. And what I want to suggest to all of us is that this is the kind of king that all of us long for. Jonathan Edwards was a great 17th century theologian and pastor, and he wrote this about that passage in Revelation. The beauty and glory of Jesus Christ consists largely in a conjunction of such largely diverse excellencies that would have otherwise seemed to us to be utterly incomparable. So true. Second point, number two. The true king, the second thing I want us to see is that the true king is deliberate in purpose. I want you to notice from the passage that Jesus deliberately sought out that donkey. Before he came into Jerusalem, he's on the Mount of Olives, he's leaving Bethany, coming down the Mount of Olives, and he tells the disciples, go and find the donkey. You'll you'll see one tied up, bring it to me. Jesus deliberately sought that donkey. Why? Because he knew that by going into Jerusalem on a donkey that it would fulfill prophecy. Okay? So this was a deliberate act. And and I want you to notice that everything that Jesus did in the coming days, from Palm Sunday to his crucifixion, everything Jesus did was deliberate. He deliberately, in other words, set up his own crucifixion. I I remember years ago, I was on a... um, tour of Israel with a, a, a bunch of pastors from around the country, and, and they had gathered together some Old and New Testament professors to lead us in lectures every night that we were there. It was a fascinating trip. And when we got to Jerusalem, there was a New Testament professor who, who did a series of lectures on the intentionality of the crucifixion. And he talked about how everything that Jesus did that last week had intentionality. He goes to the temple and he drives out the sellers of the temple. That would have been offensive to the powerful Sadducee sect in Jerusalem. He goes, he has his temple discourse in which he insults the Pharisees, calls them whited sepulchers full of dead man's bones. In other words, he is agitating the Pharisees, which was another powerful religious sect in Jerusalem. He even even insulted the Essenes because someone asked him, uh, who should I give my money to, the Lord or Israel? And he held up, he said, who's on that coin? And the man said, it's Caesar. And he said, well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. That was an offensive thing to say to an Essene who was wanting to overthrow the Roman government. And, And so every religious power within Jerusalem was insulted by Jesus in those few days that he was there in Jerusalem. In other words, this professor made the point, I thought it was an excellent point, Jesus was agitating all of the people who would eventually crucify him. He even said to the disciples before going into Jerusalem, uh, let us go to Jerusalem. I am setting my face toward Jerusalem. He said that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And Thomas said, let us go with him to die. They all knew that if he went to Jerusalem, he was going to die. And so what I want all of us to see is that, that Jesus had intentionality as he came into Jerusalem because he was intentional in dying for you and for me. Um, so... What Palm Sunday says to all of us is that the king was coming to die. And he did that for you and for me. That's his intentionality. And then number three, the king will come again. The king will come again. 
what Palm Sunday says to us is that the king is coming. He came Palm Sunday, and he will come again. Revelation chapter uh, 7, verses 9 and 10 says, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number from every nation, from all tribes of people and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits, up on, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. As Jesus goes into Jerusalem, they lay palms before him. They're waving palms. It's a way of celebrating a celebrity coming into town. And, and when Jesus sees this picture of everyone coming in, holding their palm branches, he must have thought of this passage in the book of Revelation. He must have thought of his second coming. I would imagine that that was kind of the picture that Jesus had, that they're waving their branches now. But there is going to come a time when there will be more branches that will be waving as I come. In fact, Psalm 96 says, says this, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing to joy, for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For when he comes, he will come to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in all faithfulness. When he comes, the trees of the forest will rejoice. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 12 says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth in singing, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Jesus must have thought, one day I'm coming back, and when I do, there will be trees attached to those palms, and all of the forests will be singing. Jesus is king, and he's coming again. And may I suggest that if he is your king, if he has come into you, then you will begin to take on the characteristics of his kingliness. You see, when he becomes your king, he becomes your authority, he becomes your power, and he changes you. And the qualities and the characteristics of the king come into your heart. His kingliness comes into you. And and if Jesus is your king, he will make you like himself. Jesus loved the sinner. He loved the outcast. He came to serve those who would be served. He came to care for those who uh, were on the on the margins of society. He came to love and to forgive. He came to show us the way. He came to to teach us what it meant to have life and meaning and truth. Those are the characteristics of the king. And if he is your king, then you will take on those qualities, those same characteristics. There's a a great story in uh, Luke chapter 10 about Jesus sending out 72 of his disciples to various towns to spread the word. You remember the story. Jesus told them, he said, go in, go in peace, and, and if someone accepts you, then accept their invitation. But if they don't accept you, then just, you know, wipe, wipe your hands of them and go away. Peace will come back into you. But he sent them all out, and the Bible says that he gave them authority and power to do great things, healing and Casting out demons. And and so when the 72 came back to Jesus to report on what had happened, they were all very excited about the things that had happened while they were out. He said, you wouldn't believe it, Jesus. We were able to heal people and cast out demons, and, and we were so well received. It was amazing all that had happened. And Jesus says to them in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, he says, do not rejoice that The spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. 
I just love that story. I actually think about this story a lot. These disciples coming back, bragging about all the things they were able to do in Jesus' name. They're so excited about their ministry, so excited about all the power and the great things that were done, the great things that happened, and, and the big splash that they made in all the different communities that they went to. They were so proud, so excited about how God had blessed their ministry. And they're telling Jesus about this, and I think, I guess they're wanting Jesus to high-five them and be excited with them and, and say, tell me every detail. I just want to relive it with you. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus just says, some, he just says hold up, guys. Hold up. Do not rejoice that you were able to do all of these things. The thing you need to be rejoicing is that you know the king. The thing that you need to be excited about, the thing that you need to be uh, rejoicing about is that your name is written in heaven. That's what you need to rejoice about. That's what you need to focus on. That's where your joy comes from. Your joy doesn't come from all of these things in life that you think that they're going to come from. Your joy only comes from the king. Let's pray. Would you bow your head, close your eyes? Let's just take a moment here to reflect on what God is teaching us this Palm Sunday. Just like he came that first Palm Sunday, he wants to come to you now. Maybe you've never committed your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never made him your king. You know a lot of things about him but you've never surrendered to him. He's not been your king. Or maybe you have fallen away from him. And what you recognize today is that even though you know the king, his kingliness is not in you. Would you just confess that, submit to him, ask him to forgive you and to come into your life, recommit your life to him? Lord God, how we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you work in our lives. We thank you for the way that you teach us from your word. We pray that your spirit would move in our hearts today as we think about the coming of the king. You've come to us. You've given your life for us. Even death obeyed you. But you're coming again. May our hearts be prepared. In Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Church family, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And this is, this is our prayer time. Um, this is a time that we like to pray for one another and with one another. And, and while we're doing it, we stand and we sing together. But we, we have these candles up here at the front um, for a reason. You know, a candle is something that you can light to kind of symbolize your prayer. And and the way that we like to pray using the acronym PRAY, P-R-A-Y, is either a praise or a repentance or an asking or a yielding. And you can light a candle indicating one of those prayers. Maybe you'd like someone to come and pray with you. We have pastors up here at the front who would love to pray with you, light a candle with you. Maybe you would like to come with a friend. That's fine. But when you pray and you light that candle, we all see and we all pray with you, not knowing what that prayer is, but we want to join with you in that prayer. We know that the Lord knows. So let's all stand together now, and we're going to sing. And if you'd like to come and light a candle, have some prayer with one of us, we invite you to come. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now. toils and snares I have already come Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home When we been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Turn upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace let's sing that chorus again turn your eyes upon Full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Before Norm leads us in our doxology, just want to remind you of uh, Easter Sunday, next Sunday, one worship service. We're having baptism uh, next Sunday. If you've not yet been baptized, you'd like to be uh, in that card, in your uh, car back, uh, car, in your chair back, uh, that says response card, you can fill out that you'd like to be baptized and just drop that in the bucket on your way out. Um, we're going to have a wonderful baptism service next Sunday. Some amazing stories. And that's at 1030 for Easter Sunday. Next Friday night, this coming Friday night, Good Friday worship at 630. And then Saturday, 10 to noon, Family Fun Day for the, for the children and the families. And I understand we still need some eggs for the big, all the Easter egg hunts that are going on. So... This is a, a, uh, a call for eggs. Um, and you can take those to uh, uh, Bonnie or Dondra, and they would much appreciate it. So, well, wonderful to be with you this morning. Norm, lead us in the doxology. Let's sing this. Sing it like you're walking through the pearly gates. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. See you this week.